Um, awesome scene. Here we, oh, here it is. Okay, the scripture lesson of the day is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 11 to 21. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 11 to 21. That's found in your Pew Bibles on page 1722. That's page 1722 of your Pew Bibles. Right. Since then, we, not, we know what it, is, what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade people what we, are, uh, what we are is plain to God. I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than in what is in the heart. If uh, we, quote unquote, are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. That was a lot. I know it's a lot. It's like, I'm, I'm reading it. I was like, oh, man, let's keep going. Uh, but no, but it's good. It's good stuff. Um, I'm going to start off uh, with a little story. of. It's funny because my brother says my sermons are like story time with Adriel. So, well, then so be it. You know? Um, so I'm going to start off a little story back in 2013 or so, right? Right. So my mom, I'm bad with months and years. I'm just, I'm terrible. So uh, it was when I was going to Hudson Vineyard Church right before, I could say. Um, I'm there. Uh, there's a new church and there's a congregant that knows the pastor. I kind of just met the pastor not too long ago. And, the, and the, she knew the pastor for a while, helped guide him towards having a church. It was a new church. And this lady is named Lydia. We call her Sister Lydia because she's like a prayer warrior. It's like this, she's, she's awesome. She really is. Was that? Are we good? Is that you? No? Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> prayer warrior. Yeah, prayer warrior. Yeah, amen. Thunder, thunder from someplace. Okay, uh, back, back to the, the thing. All right. So this is Sister Lydia, new church, right? So there's Sister Lydia. I met her once. And we're helping her, like, get some food over back to her house and stuff. And she seemed nice enough. It was, like, really, like, just a quick conversation. Hi, bye, how's, how's things? You love the Lord, I love the Lord, amen, cool, you know? It wasn't, like, this big the conversation or anything. And then come the Sunday, I'm not sure what day it was, was it Wednesday or Thursday or something, a few days later, Sunday service. She Mind you, I just met her just that one time. She, like after the service, walks directly towards me with, like, this face of, like, determination, you know? It's like, I don't even, like, okay. She goes, I had a dream. I was like, you were in it. I was like, wow. I'm in the dream, all right. Like, yeah, I was like, so she goes, like, it was Jesus. It was Jesus. He was, Jesus was speaking to me. It's like, wow. And she, she goes like this, and then the Lord points at 
at uh, John chapter 1, verse 47. And then I saw your face. I was like, yeah, you're like Nathaniel. And I was like, wow. You know, I, I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't know what that meant. I read the word, but, you know, it's like I failed. Uh, something had to do with, like, knowing, like, uh, little details of the Bible. I, I probably fail, to be honest. And so I go and I read it. And, like, it says, now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. And I was, I, I'm floored right now just thinking back on it. It was a real, actual, it was a compliment from God through this sister Lydia. From then on, I became friends with her, whatever. But it was like, it was amazing because I didn't start ministry yet. I didn't start doing anything. I just like kind of knew in Christ and I want to do things. Jesus is good. The uh, gospel is good. I want to spread the word. That was, that's all I knew. And the one, I guess the one thing that, followed me throughout my years, even before I was in Christ, I was always honest. Brutally so. I was brutally honest. I was to the point of, I was times mean, but I didn't even understand how mean I was. Uh, but it was a compliment because it's like, yeah, the Lord sees, well, he could use me then, you know, for the, for the truth. So, you know, a few months pass, or weeks, I'm not sure exactly how long. Eventually, the pastor's like, hey, you should be the youth pastor. So I was like, okay, I'll give it a shot. So I was going to say, go ahead. And I was like, all right. So um, I'm there. I'm, I'm teaching the youth. I'm, I'm praying uh, all the time, praying, what verses do you got for the youth? What verses do you got? And I was just like, I'm there. I'm like, uh, this is what I'm doing. I'm going to go all out, you know? And uh, youth group really started to grow. It started to be an amazing thing. It was really like a family. Like we were like our own tight-knit group. And uh, first, after a few months of doing this, I met up with other churches within, uh, within the same denomination. And I, I, I don't know why this was happening. I, I find out what this is like when I was searching through what I should do for this sermon. So I didn't know what this was for a while. But for some reason, around other youth pastors, I felt like I was a liar. It could be anything, like my favorite color is blue. And I'd feel like, wait, I'm, a, I'm like, I'm lying about that or something. And it would, it would even come off kind of like awkward and kind of like, like, uh, like anxious. It was like, you know, what's up with this, this guy? He's like, you know, he's a good youth leader. He's my, the team. But then around the other leaders, like, hi, hi, you, you know? And I wasn't sure why, like, I didn't get it. Now, it turns out there's something called imposter syndrome. Now, I, I had to, I looked this up and I was like, apparently 70% of people, the general population, actually have suffered from this sort of imposter syndrome. It's where you think that you're lying, especially around peers. You think you're not worthy. You think you're like, oh, they're gonna find out just how dumb I am or that I'm a, um, you know, I'm a loser or whatever. So I was like, I, I, didn't, I didn't know this was a thing. And it turns out Maya Angelou and Albert Einstein at one point suffered from this. Albert Einstein, Maya Angelou, these are like brilliant human beings. It was like Albert Einstein thought, I was like, oh, people are going to find out that I'm a fraud. The guy's a genius. You know? And so, like I said, like, we tend to, to, to think that our own sort of thoughts of our identity is really, really valid. You, you think that we know ourselves. But that's the thing, we don't necessarily know ourselves that much. Not as much as you think. It's weird, obviously there's a bias, right? You think, oh no, I've done this in the past, I've done this, there's no way, you know, oh, the Lord could accept me. Like I didn't know, I didn't think I could be a youth pastor. I, I grew up, to, I grew up honestly, a kind of ghetto. It was like hanging out in the streets like all the time, you know? And so I was like, I didn't really fit in, you know? Um, but I eventually gave more and more of myself to the Lord, but still had this sense that I'm lying. And uh, it turns out what I need to do and what we need to do, right, is not rely on our own selves, our own thoughts of ourselves. We have to be careful. And we have to rely more so on what Christ says about us rather than our own selves. Amen. And I have to say the reason why 
is, well, because what Christ says, first off, is more important than what we say, than what we think. Now, not only that, Christ is perfect. Jesus is literally truth and goodness embodied. So when Christ says something about you, that's more accurate than what you think about your own self. Now, that's hard to understand, but that is the truth. God is more accurate with who you are rather than your own self. And not only that, God truly wants what is best for you. Amen? He created us. And on top of that, God is stable. He has, he's, he's never changing. He's always loving. He's always caring. We could be like, oh, I'm like this. I'm like that today. I'm like this. We could be all over the place with our heart, with our mind, with what we think about ourselves. You see, it says in Jeremiah 17, verse 9, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things, desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? We have to be careful that we don't just think of ourselves. Uh, we don't hold on to our identity that we think of ourselves. We first look to how the Lord sees us. And one of the things how the Lord sees us, it says it uh, you know, within one of the verses I read, uh, we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak to Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, we never, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sins, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So, what is the definition of an ambassador? We are an ambassador to Christ here on earth. It is a high-ranking official sent by a state, sovereign nation, also seen maybe as an authorized representative or a messenger. So when I'm, when I'm hearing that, it's a title. I want you to think, think whenever we have a title in the Bible, title equals function, okay? You're not just a something. You're something, so that thing that you are, the title that you have, means that there's an action that is in line with that. So if we are an ambassador to Christ, we should stay learning more and more so how to defend the word, how to stay true to the word, how to, how to help people out who have tough questions. Not just say like, well, you know, Christ lives in my heart. I love God. God is good. And that's, you know, it's, that's the only answer you got. That does not sound like an ambassador to Christ. Amen? It's high rank, we're like high ranking officials here on earth for the Lord. And it's not because of us, it's not because of our ability, or how smart we are, or, or any of that nature. It really is the primary thing of our identity is that we are joined to the Lord through the Holy Spirit. Amen. That is the reason why. Because it truly isn't just us. It's the Holy Spirit living within us. We are like family of God both in being a bride that the Lord pursues, and also we are like children. We are called to know the Lord uh, in the same word, in the same way as Adam and Eve conceived their children, is the same way the Lord asks for us to know him. A deep sense of an intimate relationship with the Lord. Now, Jesus uh, once said, it's like, uh, you come to me saying, Lord, Lord, uh, what do you call it? I'm sorry. Um, oh, you've, you've casted out demons in my name. You've prophesied. Uh, you know, I've done all of this stuff. And then the Lord Jesus would be like, get away from me, you who do evil. I never knew you. So that knew, that know, that knowing is the same word in Genesis that it says Adam knew Eve and a... And they conceive uh, Seth and Abel. So we are married to the Lord. There is this sense of a marriage to God. It's his spirit of love and truth that are within us, joined to our spirit. Now, it's, it's funny, a, a little bit of a story too. I was, I was talking about like, oh, well, what's the definition of like, no, not the, hold on. Why do marriages fail? Someone asked me that question. I'm like half asleep 
I was in Miami just this past week, so now this is going to be in the sermon. It's like, why do marriages fail for the most part? I'm literally with my eyes half shut. It's like back in my head how the, how the Lord works. We have, there's, a, there's a title, so there's a function, so there's a role, right? So I said a husband is the husband to a wife, okay? Like, like uh, Jimbo Johnny is the husband to, to Susie Q, and Susie Q... She, she has to say, I am the wife of, like, Jimbo Johnny, right? So it's this role. It's not that, uh, like, I am the husband. It's like, no, 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 she is my wife, so I would treat her as such. And she would be like, uh, that's my husband. I would treat him as such. And what is that? That as such is that there is a covenant. There is a vow made when there's a marriage, right? To death do us part to sickness and in health, like until you die, right? So there is a covenant there. There's a vow you made. It is public. Same thing if you're being baptized, baptized in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. It's very much like you are now married to God with this baptism. You're making it known. Obviously, you loved the Lord before that. Obviously, husband and wife, they loved each other before they officially got married, right? But now it's this public sort of covenant that is out there. And a covenantial love, a Christ-like love uh, for marriage and just for a Christ-like love b uh, between us and the Lord is one, is unconditional. And two, uh, having faith to the commitment. So in other words, you are concerned with your own role, right? If you're the husband, you have to make sure you are, are the good husband. It's not dependent on how good of a wife the woman is. Amen. It's dependent on the fact that you made a covenantal agreement, right? I don't want to like look at anyone's one face like too long. Like, what do you know? No. <laughs> it's a covenantal. It's a covenantal agreement you make. It is between you and the Lord and that person, and you stay committed to it. It says the only two reasons to to break up a marriage, right, would be. One, if, if the person's unfaithful. Or two, if, if you're in danger of your life. There's the only two ways that, that, you, that you should uh, like, uh, leave the marriage. Only two ways to, you should divorce. So, with that in mind, we are to look at the person that we're supposed to, be, are supposed to show covenantal love. To think of that person as the most important person to your life. So that's not dependent on how well that other person performs. That's dependent on the fact that you made that covenant, you made that promise, and you're going to live it out. You're going to stick through it. Because where there's a title, there's a function. Amen? And so this is in a way, that's why it was Ephesians chapter 5. This is in a way how we are married to the Lord. It says the church is the bride of Christ. Amen. Amen. The church is the bride of Christ. It says that several, several times. And it says that we are like the bride specifically because it was Jesus as, as the groom pursuing the bride. Amen. So us church, we are pursued by Jesus. Amen. Amen. So marriage is covenantal. There is a title. And then we could have this deep sense of intimacy with the Lord through prayer and through the word, you know, you give and you show all your vulnerability, all of your weakness, all of your insecurity, all of that to the Lord in prayer. Uh, we are joined to God when we are saved. We are no longer ourselves when born again with the spirit of Christ. Our flesh is crucified with Christ. We are no longer slaves to sins, to sin, uh, or the flesh, but married to Christ in spirit. We are one. Just way in a marriage, the two shall become one flesh. You no longer live for yourself. You live for the other, and the other lives for you. Amen? Amen. So, uh, in uh, a particular YouTube channel uh, by Melissa Doherty, uh, she talks about different things related to Christ, related to, to just tough questions. Sometimes she has music. 
she's a, a great uh, a child of God, a fellow, fellow believer. She did an interview one time. The full interview is like an hour long. I, I mean, I thought it was amazing. But there was like a little two-minute clip, and it was beautiful. It was an interview with this one of her friends. Her name's Jen, and she's an ex-New Ager lesbian. And in the interview, she said this. It's not about the way she was born. It's not about being born a certain way. That's not what matters. What matters is about being born again. Amen. She was a born again in the spirit. Now, people need to hear about Christ, Christ's grace and the fulfillment for our need for intimacy within the relationship with the Lord. The thing is with this, with this lady, with Jen, she, you know, she's there. She's, what she says is that she's, she still hasn't stopped necessarily the same-sex attraction. But she did stop being a slave to sin. So I know it's maybe tough to, to yeah. She did, it's not like, oh, the Lord changed her brain. Or, no, she was, she loves the Lord. That's where her intimacy is with. Amen. Her intimacy is with God. And though it may be hard to think, sometimes we think people should, everyone should get married. Paul wasn't married. Jesus wasn't married. There's some people that just through the grace of God. It's like always, it was the grace. She said it was because of how trusting the Lord is to help change how she lived. It may have not have changed completely how her brain operates or functions, but it's, a, it's about how she's living now. She lives for the Lord. Another example I could think of is a, is a guy named David Wood. This man, really brave, but I'll tell you why he's so brave. He points out the errors in Islam, and he's really brutal and really honest and straightforward. He gets thousands of death threats. And it's like, it doesn't even phase him. It actually strengthens him. You're like, this guy's crazy. He legally has an anti-personality disorder he is clinically a psychopath, loves God, serves God. The Lord is able to use someone like that. Amen. There's different parts of the body of Christ, okay? This, I know it's like it's crazy to hear. Yeah, but this man loves the Lord, serves the Lord. There's no sense of fear, right? Whenever someone like tries to point out, like, oh, I'm going to kill you and your kids and take, take pictures of where he lives. He's like, go ahead, I don't know. It's like it's just not there. But he knows of Jesus. He has a testimony of God's love. He's like, wow, God is superior. Jesus is a superior man to me. And to him, that blew his mind away. Because he was able to logically and philosophically figure it out that Jesus is superior to him. No emotion behind it. The Lord's able to use him. The Lord's able to use Jen. In whatever state or frame of mind they have, they're there, they serve the Lord. And so we have to understand everyone needs to know of the love of God. Everyone needs to know of the love of Christ. There's no favoritism in the kingdom of God. I don't fully understand people that have these sort of behavioral things or different sexual orientations. It doesn't matter that I don't understand. All I know is that I am Christ's ambassador. I'm supposed to bring the love of Christ to everyone. And then it's the grace of God that changes hearts, lives. It changes the way people think. It changes what they do with their lives. Mind you, I would still say, it says it in Romans chapter 1. It says it in 1 Timothy chapter 1. It says it in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that the practicing of homosexuality is a sin. That's what it says in these verses. But just because someone may have thoughts versus someone acted upon those thoughts, someone may have an issue with it, right? And struggle with certain sins that we may not understand. But we still love them as brothers and sisters in Christ for those that want the Lord in their hearts and in their lives. Just, just different sin issues, and some of them, like I said, we don't fully understand. We don't see from their eyes. But we know that Christ lives within us, so we should spread that love of Christ. Amen? Amen. 
she, Jen, is now fulfilled in her intimacy with Christ in that marriage. She is married to the Lord. She'll say that. That's how she lives. She's not there struggling. She's there thriving. She's full of joy. She's full of peace, godly wisdom. This is now how she's living. Amen? As, as, as children of God, we are privileged beyond any human or worldly standards. We are co-heirs with Jesus Christ, and that's better than any sort of uh, social economic standard or, or anything of, of that nature. Our status is in the Lord, not in who we are here on earth, not in our occupation. Our occupation here is to be God's hands and feet of his love. Amen? Amen? And not only that, a part of our identity is that we are a kingdom of priests. A kingdom of priests. What does that mean? Is that we are responsible for intercessory prayer for this world. We see things going on in this world. I mean, I have, I have, I have talks. Where, oh, man, can you believe what's happening here and over there? I, I'm starting to get more into international news. And... Is it, is it godly? Is it not godly? Well, I still have peace and joy in my heart and my life, no matter how horrible the world seems. It just gives me a list of things to pray about now. I, I, it's like, my gosh, these you know, people suffering in North Korea, people suffering in China, you know, Taiwan being threatened of being taken over by China. Oh, my gosh, this is, this is some real drama going on out there in the world, you know? And it's like, oh, what do we do? This world's terrible. This world, like, pray about it. Pray about the news that you hear then. If it's so bad, that means it needs prayer. Amen? And that's part of our job as, as, as fellow believers in Christ. And as children of God, say, I want the occupation in part, we're kingdom of priests. And as children of God, we do suffer here on earth. So, like, why is there, why is there suffering? Well... Let's read, I'll read Romans uh, chapter 8, verses 15 to 17. Uh, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are his heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. It's like, oof. So, a part, another part of how we are, of our identity, is children of God. And, yeah, a good parent is going to prepare the children for the harshness and the cold reality of this world. The world's, not, the world's not nice. The world won't give you breaks. The older you get, when you make a mistake, the worse that mistake gets. I mean, just think about falling down as an 8-year-old versus an 80-year-old. It's not like, you can't protect you. <laughs> you can't protect your kids from all the, all, everything. You should prepare them. So a part of being preparing your children is through discipline and sometimes punishment. Because the reality is the world will punish you. Maybe, I mean, obviously way harsher. The world will punish you way harsher than your, your parents will. So God is our parent. We are intimately locked in, like in a marriage. And he is also our parent. There's several parts to this. It's hard to, to put one just metaphor. We're talking about heaven and angels and God and... <laughs> So there's several metaphors that need to take place. So we are like his children. We do suffer because when we suffer, we're able to be prepared better for this world. We're able to be prepared better for the attacks from the world, from Satan, from our own flesh. The Lord has to prepare us. God has to prepare us. Amen? Amen. So... This kind of went off. So we are we are joined, we are joined to the Lord, uh, and uh, we are joined to the Lord 
to do his will, to live as he wills. Our body is no longer just our body, right? Our flesh also belongs to the Lord, for the Holy Spirit lives with our spirit. There's that deep sense of intimacy, the way a husband and a wife, deeply intimate. We are children of God, so we are co-heirs in in the glory. We're co-heirs in that suffering uh, with the Lord. And, uh, you know, we are the bride of Christ and we are co-heirs. And remember, let us think of who we are, not in our identity, in, in race, in gender, in political ideology, in occupation, in socioeconomic standards, or upper class, middle class, lower class. No, no. True believer, all true believers, we are, uh, are in his light We are children of God. We are intimately connected to the Lord. God's spirit lives within us. Let that be the main thing of how you live. Let that be who you are. You are an ambassador to Christ. Uh, You are part of the kingdom of priests. You are, your flesh and your soul, your body is married to Christ. And you are a child of God. Make sure That is what's primary in knowing who you are. Amen? Amen? Amen. And don't forget it. Let's all bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you, Lord, uh, for your love. I thank you, Lord, that you want to reach out to every human being and show them your love, Lord. That first and foremost, before we could tell anyone that someone does something wrong or anything like that, first, let's show them Christ's love. Let's be the ambassadors of heaven itself. Let's be your hands and your feet. Lord, let us be your image bearers. For Lord, you created us in your image. And your image, Lord, is not just a particular look or anything. But you always, always show love and grace and goodness, kindness. You are perfectly balanced in mercy and in justice. You are full of wisdom, Lord. I pray, Holy Spirit, work in our hearts and in our lives to be made more and more into the image and likeness of Christ. May we be more submissive to the Spirit of God and and less uh, prideful and egotistical, Lord. May we understand, Lord, that sometimes we grow through hard times, Lord, but that is because you're preparing us for the harshness and the realities of this world of the kingdom of Satan, and of the the downfalls of giving in to the flesh. I pray, Lord, that we're able to always show your love, Lord, for it is your love that flows within us. And in Jesus' name, amen.